Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, you guys are, are hardcore, because I certainly wouldn't have come out on a night like tonight to hear me. That's <laughs> All right, we have, a, we have a lot to talk about, so we're going to get going right away. We want to talk about restoring nature's relationships. Nature is a series of specialized relationships, and if you, if you destroy them, you've essentially destroyed nature. So how do we put them back together again? Because in a lot of places, we really have ripped them apart. Uh, I, I talked in uh, California not too long ago, and, and uh, after the talk, a lady came up and she said, here are my notes. So this is, this is what you're striving for if you're taking notes tonight. Turns out she was a graphic uh, artist, but, but I thought that was pretty good. She said, it's all on there. I haven't actually read it, but uh, that's good. Okay, um, this is, we're going to start with the resplendent quetzal because it's a good example of what a specialized relationship is in nature. It's, a, it's an endangered species in the forests of Central America, and it's endangered for one primary reason. It's a very specialized diet. If you don't have fruits of the, of the wild avocado tree, you don't have that beautiful bird. And we have cut down most of the wild avocado trees. Uh, but we want that bird in our future, so we figured out we can actually put those trees back. That's what these folks are doing here. That's an avocado tree there. Um, fortunately, they grow pretty quickly. They reach the age at which they produce those fruits in not too many years, and it's starting to look better for the future of that beautiful bird. But that same conservation scenario is repeated time and again in the, uh, in the tropics. If you want to save the jaguar, you have to have particular species of palm trees. Why palm trees? Because they make palm nuts. And palm nuts happen to be the favorite food of peccaries, which is the favorite food of jaguars. <laughs> so we're talking about specialization in the natural world, but particularly uh, specialization focused on food webs as being the rule rather than the exception, and it always starts with plants. Now again, a lot of people think you get all that specialization in the tropical areas of the world because there is so much down there. Uh, but we have a great deal of specialization up here in the temperate zone as well. And some of the most specialized relationships that have ever evolved occur right in our yards. This is one of them. This is the, the bola spider. That's a female bola spider hanging from a river birch leaf in my yard. Uh, and it's obvious why she's called a bola spider. She doesn't spin a web. She just drops a single strand of silk uh, with one sticky glob of glue at the end there. Now she doesn't swing it around her, her head like a bola <laughs> But the first time I, I saw her do this, I told her, you're not going to catch anything. Uh, because I could not imagine some, something flying into that single target uh, by accident. Uh, and, and uh, you know, she looks like she goes fishing with it. She lowers it and raises it and lowers it real slowly. And, and that's the way I used to fish, and I didn't catch anything. So I was sure she wouldn't. But about 15 seconds later, a moth flew in and got stuck on her sticky glob of glue. And she reeled it in and, and actually manipulated it for quite some time and turned it into a very fancy egg mass. Uh, well, I learned that uh, that was not an accident. She was releasing the sex pheromone of that particular species of moth. So that guy's a male, and he thought she was a female. She was, but the wrong species. <laughs> uh, and that was the end of him. And it turns out that every species of bola spider in the world mimics a sex pheromone of one species of moth. So you can have bola spiders in your yard if you have the plant that supports the larval development of the moth that your bola spider is mimicking the sex pheromone of. It's right in your yard. This is uh, Phlox de Vericator, very common spring ephemeral, and it spreads readily by seed, but only if it's pollinated. And if you look at the entrance to that corolla, it's extremely narrow. Watch native bees land on these flowers. They try to get their mouth parts in there, but they can't do it. It's too small. So who is pollinating our phlox? Well, it's day-flying sphinx moths, things like this hummingbird sphinx or this snowberry clear wing. They have very uh, long tongues, and they sink them deep into that, that corolla there. And when they pull them out, they're the right width. I mean, they might be a little sticky, I don't know, but they're covered with pollen. And then they move to the next flower. Excellent pollinators. So you can get your flocks pollinated, make lots of seed if you have adult snowberry clearwings. Um, you can have adult snowberry clearwings if you have larval snowberry clearwings. And you can have larval snowberry clearwings if you have coral honeysuckle, the native honeysuckle, because that is their host plant. So even animals we don't think of as having specialized relationships with plants often do, at least uh, at one particular time of their, their life history. And I'm going to use Carolina chickadee as an example. Now around here you have black-capped chickadee, but they're doing the same thing. Uh, by the way, you know what the Cherokees used to call chickadees? I forget. <laughs> I'll remember halfway through the talk. 
Isn't it sad? Oh, <laughs> The Cherokees had a really neat name for chickadees. Maybe somebody will think of it. <laughs> oh, dear. All right. Well, we always think of chickadees as seed eaters. They're the bird of hope. The bird of hope. That's what they are. They are the bird of hope. No, they're the bird of truth. <laughs> the bird of truth. And the chickadees are going to tell us what the truth is. OK. They are seed eaters during the winter one of the most common birds at our, our feeders, um, where 50% of their diet is seed. The other 50% is, is insects, believe it or not. But when it comes time to reproduce, to make more chickadees, they can't feed their baby seeds. Their babies can't digest seeds, so they have to eat insects. Uh, and it turns out that um, the best insects for them to eat are caterpillars. So if they're in a healthy environment, chickadees feed their young as many caterpillars as they possibly can. Um, and if they're in a really good in environment, they'll feed them almost exclusively on, on caterpillars. Uh, and it turns out that chickadees are not exceptions. Most birds are rearing their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. So why caterpillars? There are a lot of other insects out there. Why are birds focusing on caterpillars? I've been thinking about this for a while, and I've got a couple of hypotheses. One is that caterpillars are beautiful. We've got the Pandora sphinx, beautiful Pandora sphinx, the Coletus silk moth. Spiny rose caterpillar, black spotted prominent, the curved line owlet, the fawn sphinx. I think that's art in the garden right there. Black swallowtail, very common but very beautiful. Purple crested slug, major daytana, the hieroglyphic moth, spun glass caterpillar, that's my favorite. Or it could be that they have cool names. Maybe the birds like the cool names, like the green marvel, the once charred punky, the confused wood grain the cynical ground cat, the neighbor, the Donald. <laughs> yes, yes, come on. All right, that's not really the Donald. Why not? All right, maybe the birds don't care if they're pretty or if they have cool names, but they do care about some very practical things. And one of them is that most caterpillars are soft. And that means you can stuff them down the throat of your, of your offspring without fear of injuring the esophagus. And if you've ever watched a, a parent bird feed their young, that's what they do. They take their bill and it's like a plunger right, right down there. So that has to be uh, something that's important. They're also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is, is equal to 200 aphids. So some of our, our warblers and smaller birds will chase aphids, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or, or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious, they're very high in protein, uh, very high in fats. They have a low percentage of chitin, particularly compared to, to other insects like beetles. Chitin is the exoskeleton, you can't digest it, and beetles are like little tanks. They're mostly exoskeletons, so not, so not so great food. And it turns out that they are the best source of carotenoids, particularly during the breeding season. Now, later on in the season, birds get a lot of carotenoids from uh, berries, but in the spring, the berries haven't been made yet. Why do I mention carotenoids? Well, carotenoids are uh, compounds that are only made by plants. We vertebrates don't make them, yet we need them. They're important components of our diet. That's why my wife Cindy tells me I have to eat my, my carrots to get my beta carotene. <clears throat> I have to eat my, my tomatoes to get my lycopene, my whatever that is to get my lutein. She makes sure I eat all of that stuff because they stimulate my immune system. I'm generally healthier if I have lots of carotenoids. They're antioxidants. They run around uh, our bodies and, and protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better, she was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality. Who doesn't need that? Improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about this male prothonotary uh, warbler here who's taking the carotenoids and building pigments out of them and putting them in his, his feathers. Uh, and he is bright yellow because he had access to lots of lutein's. And of course, the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. Uh, well, back to chickadees, they're vertebrates, so they're not making their own, own carotenoids. They have to get them from plants, but they're not eating plants when they're reproducing, so they have to get them from something that does eat plants. And yes, that's something as insects, but here's the key. Caterpillars, it turns out, have twice as many carotenoids as other types of insects, and three times as many as spiders. And spiders are important components of, of bird diets. Um, so it, it, it's looking like caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. They are essential parts of bird diets. And that means if you're in an area where there are not enough caterpillars, you're not going to be able to successfully reproduce. 
So that's the next question. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of, of chickadees? Having almost enough caterpillars isn't good enough. You gotta have enough or you're not gonna be able to produce those, those babies. Well, the answer is uh, it takes 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make a clutch of chickadees. Um, by a man by the name of, of uh, Brewer, Richard Brewer, I think it was, sat by a nest and he counted all the caterpillars. There's 390 to 570 a day and they're in the nest for 16 days. Now after they fledge, the, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 30 days, but just to the point where they fledge at 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars. Who knows how many caterpillars after they fledge because they're flying all over the place. And chickadees are tiny birds, third of an ounce. What if I wanted to make a red belly woodpecker? It's eight times heavier than a caterpillar. How many, how many, uh, no, eight times <laughs> heavier than a chickadee. How many caterpillars does that take? And of course, I don't want just chickadees and, and uh, red belly woodpeckers in, in my yard. I want a, a diverse assemblage of birds. I want the scarlet tanager. I want tufted tip mice and blue jays and bluebirds and tree swallows and common yellow throats and indigo bunnings and towhees and yellow warblers and wood thrushes and wrens and cardinals and hummingbirds, all birds that at least used to be common in our neighborhoods. And I don't want just one pair of them. I want breeding populations. So can you imagine the number of caterpillars it takes to, to accomplish that? I can't and I've been thinking about it. Now you might say, well, we don't need any insects to feed our hummingbirds because they eat sugar water. And of course they do eat sugar water. But it turns out 80 to 90% of a hummingbird's diet is insects and spiders and then they go get the sugar water. And sugar water is sugar water, it's not protein. You don't build a bird out of, of sugar water. And it turns out that is true for, for um, what, 96% of all of the, the terrestrial birds in North America, that's a list of bird families that are rearing their young directly or indirectly on insect protein. And this is news. This is news to a lot of people. It's news to uh, people who write uh, Landscape for Birds books. They will tell you how to put plants in your yard that make seeds and berries. Of course, that's, that's good. That's necessary for the birds that eat seeds and berries after they have reproduced. But we also have to put the the plants in our yard that make the insects that allow these birds to reproduce. Because there's not enough areas outside of our yards these, these days to support these, these birds. We need to do it at home. So this is a little bit of a generalization, but it's pretty close to true. No insects, no baby birds. All right, how do we do that? What types of landscapes are capable of producing the abundance and diversity of insects that we're talking about here? Well, now we have to get back to specialized relationships. We have to talk about the most common type of specialized relationship that occurs all over the planet, and that is a relationship between the insects that eat plants and the plants themselves. So we're not talking about pollinators right now, we're talking about things like this polyphemus moth caterpillar and the oak leaf that it's eating. Remember, plants really don't wanna be eaten. They wanna capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And if you don't believe me, if spring ever comes and the leaves ever leaf out, <laughs> go and eat one and see if you like it. You're not gonna like it. There's a reason it's hard to get our kids to eat our, the, our, the vegetables we want them to eat. Because plants don't taste good when they're loaded with these, these compounds. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why in the summertime it is green. It's green, not because there's not enough insects out there to eat those plants, but because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat those plants. They are too well protected chemically. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, they specialize. 90% of the insects that eat plants are what we call host plant specialists. They pick one or two plant lineages that share a common cocktail of chemical defenses and they, they develop the adaptations that allow them to circumvent those, those defenses. They develop the enzymes and the physiological mechanisms that, that can uh, store and excrete and detoxify those compounds. They develop behavioral adaptations that allow them to avoid the compounds typically in space and life history adaptations that allow them to avoid the compounds in, in time. But it takes a long period of exposure so those plant lineages for all these adaptations to fall into place does not happen overnight. I'm gonna use the monarch butterfly as an example because you already know half the story of the monarch. Um, you already know that it is a specialist on milkweeds. 
And there's nothing special about monarch specialization on milkweeds. All the 90% of the insects that are specialists have a relationship like this with their particular host plant. Uh, milkweeds, of course, are, are toxic plants. They're filled with cardiac glycosides. When you're out there eating plants this spring, don't eat a milkweed. <laughs> because cardiac, cardiac glycosides will stop your heart if you eat enough of it. It doesn't stop the monarch's heart. And they do have a heart, by the way, because they've got those physiological adaptations that allow them to eat cardiac glycosides without dying. But what about the sticky latex sap that is in milkweeds? It gives milkweeds their common name. When we break up a, mil a milkweed leaf, or a vein, you get that, that white goo that comes out. Um, if you get it on your finger, you usually wipe it off right away. But if you don't wipe it off and let it sit there for a minute or so, it starts to gel. It turns into a chewing gum-like substance. Uh, and that's its defensive property. It glues the mouth part shut of, of anything that crawls on, onto milkweed and, and tries to eat it. Well, we do know that, that monarchs crawl on the milkweeds and try to eat it, so how do they eat milkweeds without getting their mouth parts glued shut? You can watch this. If you put milkweeds in your yard, the monarch will, will come, crawl onto a leaf. It typically goes to the end of the leaf and it starts to eat. And if any latex sap oozes out, it'll stop eating immediately, turn around, crawl back up the leaf, maybe two-thirds of the way, and it chews through the midrib. What it's doing, this is a behavioral adaptation that blocks the flow of the latex sap from this end of the leaf to this end of the leaf. So now this whole end of the leaf has no more latex and the monarch can turn around and go down and eat the leaf without worrying about gluing its mouth shut. Of course, that flags the leaf. So if you're a monarch hunter, you can drive down the road and, and look at milkweed patches and anything that has flagged leaves, you know there was a monarch there. All right, those are the upsides of, of specialization. Um, by, by developing these highly specialized adaptations, the monarch can eat a plant that is unavailable to most other insects that are out there. That reduces competition, and it works out really well for the monarch as long as there's milkweeds around. The downside of specialization is that now that's all monarchs can eat. So by specializing on that one lineage, the, the Asclepius, um, they have not to spend any evolutionary time developing the adaptations that allow them to get around the tannins that are in oaks, or the cucurbitations that are in cucurbits, or the, the nicotine in tobacco, or the cyanide in cherry, and on and on and on. Every plant lineage has chemical defenses. But the monarchs can only eat one because that's where they spent their evolutionary time. And of course, that means if we take the milkweeds out of our landscapes, we lose the monarch. And that's exactly what we have done. Um, particularly over the last decade, uh, we, you know, we, we now, well, we never shared our residential areas very well with, with milkweeds. There were plenty of milkweeds on the edges of ag fields, but now we have Roundup Ready corn and soybeans. No more weeds. We've gotten rid of the weeds, and that includes the milkweeds that develop the monarchs. That includes the goldenrods and the esters and the other fall blooming plants that allow the monarch to migrate down to Mexico in the fall. It includes all those flowering weeds that, um, are, are the nourishment for the 4,000 species of native bees that we have out there. All these things are in decline because we've, we've kind of cleaned up all the areas that, that humans are in. You know, we have a, a, uh, we have a marketing issue with native plants. We call so many of them weeds, like milkweed. We call them weeds because when Europeans came over and started farming, anything that grew up in their field was considered a weed, and that's how they got their name. So Joe Pye weed, New York iron weed. If we called milkweed monarch's delight, <laughs> then it, we, that's cultural permission to plant it. But as long as we call it a weed, kill it. Got to get rid of it. I don't want you to think it, that it's just uh, uh, moths and butterflies that are host plant specialists. This is the elderberry beetle that only eats elderberry. This is the dogbane beetle only eats dogbane. Sumac flea beetle only eats sumac. This is uh, a Korean bug, leaf-footed bug that only eats ash. So if the emerald ash borer comes and kills all of our ashes, we will lose this species. Dave Wagner at the University of Connecticut has finished a paper looking at the number of ash specialists. It's 95, 95 species will disappear if we lose our, our ashes. And that's the problem, the fact that so many of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. If we take away those plants, we will lose all of those, those insects. There is some good news here, though, and that is as we learn more and more about um, the components of individual food webs, uh, 
That means we have the knowledge now to put those food webs back, rebuild them wherever we want to. So let's do that. Let's do that right at home. Let's do that in our yards. Let's use the white-eyed vireo as an example. And I'm gonna use that as an example because that's the nest that Cindy found in our yard uh, a couple years ago. Now the, the uh, vireos knew that in order for me to understand what their food web was, was built from, I had to identify the caterpillars they were bringing back to their babies. If I can identify the caterpillar, I take a picture of it and identify the caterpillars, we know a lot about what caterpillars eat, which plants created those caterpillars. Then I'll know which plant I need to, to put in the yard to support the food web for the white-eyed vireo. They knew all that, so they built the nest very low so I could set my camera up again and take pictures of what they were, were bringing back. So let's do this for a few minutes. That is the blinded sphinx moth, a specialist on black cherry. We have a lot of black cherries at home, making that, that moth and the babies get to eat. This little guy is the chestnut caesura, and despite its common name, it's a specialist on native viburnums. Now at our house, that's viburnum dentatum. Uh, we know that because that's what we planted. Our, our yard was mowed for hay when we moved in, so we know the plants that are there. They're the ones that we, we put there. And our viburnum dentatum, our arrowwood, is now making chestnut caesura so the babies get to eat again. This little guy with a white stripe is the drab prominent, a specialist on sycamore. Now we did not plant sycamore, but uh, maybe 15 years ago, there was a big wind, blew in some sycamore seeds from, from someplace. One landed in my cold frame and germinated, and I'm not very fast at weeding things out. It's now well over 40 feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> but it's making drab prominence so the babies get to eat again. So on and on we go. This is the eight-spotted forester moth, a specialist on, on native grapes. We have lots of those. The lunate zaley, another specialist on, on black cherry. This is the spice bush swallowtail. There's its phony eye that's supposed to scare the bird into thinking it's a tree snake. Didn't work this time. Well, it's a specialist on spice bush and its close relative sassafras. They share common chemicals. <clears throat> this is the tufted bird dropping moth, another specialist on black cherry. So black cherry is emerging as, as a really important component of, of this species uh, food web. But these guys are hungry. They need a lot more than that. So let's put some black walnut in the landscape. If we do that, we get the walnut sphinx, the gray edge boma loca, the black blotch caesura, the bride, all specialist on black walnut. Put native maples in our, our yards. We get the uh, Plagodes inchworms, the green stripe maple worm, the maple bantam dagger moth, and of course, many others. Native elms, that's the American elm, give us the four horn sphinx, uh, the double tooth prominent, the interrupted dagger moth, and again, many others. Remember, 90% of the insects that this bird needs to rear its young will not be in our yard if we don't put the plants that make those insects in our yard as, as well. So if we want the mustard sallow, we need witch, hazer, witch hazel. If we want the hackberry emperor, we need hackberry. If we want Coculio asteroides, we need native asters. The Arcidura flower moth and brown hooded owlet need goldenrod. Hog sphinx, Pandora sphinx, abbot sphinx all need Virginia creeper. Redbud leaf roller needs redbud, the gray furcula needs native willows, the turbulent phosphilla needs greenbriar, and the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, <laughs> The white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and many, many more won't be there if you don't have oaks, because oaks are the most important plant you could put in your yard. And that is true in 84% of the counties of North America, the most, most powerful plant that we have. By the way, you know where I took all those pictures? My front yard. <laughs> I don't like the term backyard habitat because it implies everything we're talking about is so ugly we have to hide it in the backyard. Not true, you can put your oak in the front yard. It works wonderfully. Why do we want all these insects? Well, we talked about birds, they need the insects, we want our birds, but it turns out if you look closely at various food webs, they are a critical component of almost every terrestrial food web that we have. All spiders, for example, need insects. Or they eat other spiders that, that ate insects. Uh, and I know a lot of people don't, don't like spiders, but look who does. It's the second most important component of bird food webs. You take away the spiders, you've clobbered your birds again. Plus, you've lost a very valuable predator. Rather than, than hiring the, the mosquito fogger that kills everything as it goes down the street, get a few spiders, they'll do the same thing. 
this is a, an insect predator needing, uh, eating an insect herbivore. So if we lost the herbivores, we would lose the predators, and they themselves are important components of, of food webs. If we lost our insects, we would lose our frogs and our toads, all of the amphibians, because they all eat insects. So do our lizards, so do our bats, so do our rodents, believe it or not. We always think of rodents as seed eaters, and they do eat seed when they can't find enough insects. But the reason these little guys all want insects is because they're really good food. Pound for pound, some studies have shown there's twice as much protein in insect meat as there is in beef. Uh, and insects have organs in their abdomen called fat bodies that are, that are um, loaded with lipids, high energy compounds that allow these little guys to grow quickly and reproduce quickly. And if you're a mouse, that's what you want to do because there's a lot of things that want to eat you. But it's the same reason that larger organisms are, are eating insects. Um, they're just really good food. The, the, the skunk is digging up your yard to get the grubs that are in your yard. Possums eat a lot of insects. Raccoons eat a lot of insects. Even things we don't think of as insectivores eat a lot of insects. Like our friend, the, the red fox here, 25% of a red fox's diet is, is insects. That's a full quarter of its diet is insects. 23% of a black bear's diet is insects. So it doesn't matter how big you are, you still need insects. Even if you don't eat insects, you need insects. This is a sharp shin hawk, it's a bird predator. You might think, aha, I can get rid of all the insects in my neighborhood and still have sharp shin hawks. But think about it. The birds this guy is eating needed insects to become birds. So he needs them indirectly. So does the garter snake. It's not eating the insects directly, but it's eating the frogs and toads that ate the insects. A world without insects is a world without biological diversity. And E.O. Wilson told us decades ago that a world without biological diversity is a world without humans. I wish somebody would believe him. <laughs> because it's happening, it's happening. We're losing our insects. I don't know if you've seen the studies out of, out of Germany recently, New York Times. 30% of Europe's grasshoppers and katydids and crickets, the orthopterans, are now facing extinction, 30%. Germany has lost, this is 5.3 fold, it's really 79% of its flying insects since 1989. There are 46 species of moths and butterflies that have already disappeared entirely from Germany. An invertebrate abundance, and that's insects, has declined 45% globally since 1974. E.O. Wilson also said insects are the little things that run the world. And let me remind you, in case you, you don't know or have forgotten, E.O. is never wrong. <laughs> We've lost 45% of the little things that run the world. This is not good news, folks. We have to turn this around. And of course, if you take away the insects that everything else is eating, you're going to lose those creatures as, as well. The World Wildlife Fund just generally says, well, we've lost half of the animals on, on planet Earth so far. Um, well, how about, how about birds? We do measure what's happening to birds because we like birds. We have something called the State of the Birds Report comes out every year. As of 2016, I'm afraid to look at 2017. There were 432 species of North American birds at risk of extinction. And that doesn't mean there's only five left of each one of those. It means their populations are declining so rapidly, they're on that trajectory that is very difficult to turn around. We now have 1.5 billion fewer breeding birds in North America than we had just 40 years ago. And let me remind you that a billion is a thousand million. And this is a problem of, of a shifting baseline. I, th I know almost everybody in this room is younger than 40, which means you don't remember a time when there were 1.5 billion more breeding birds in North America. So when you go outside and it's quiet, you don't miss them. You think that's normal. None of us here misses the passenger pigeon, the most numerous bird on the planet, not that long ago, three billion, three billion of them. We don't miss them because we never knew them. Um, well, we need to start missing these things because it's not normal. 45. 46%, no, 46 species have lost half their population. You can go to the State of the Birds report and get all kinds of nasty statistics. And what they're telling you is that the ecosystems supporting our birds are not happy. And of course, they're the same ecosystems that are supporting us. That's why this is an, this is an important message for humans. It doesn't matter whether you live in Manhattan or Beijing. It doesn't matter whether you hate all the life around you. You absolutely need it. You need it because that life is running the ecosystems that support you. Uh, we need to turn around, as I said before, so let's, let's do that. Let's figure out what the problem is. We do have parks, we have preserves. We're in the middle of a national park here. Why isn't that good enough? 
Uh, it's not good enough for a couple of reasons, but well, the biggest one is that they're not big enough. Our parks and preserves are not big enough. When you take a large area like this and you shrink it down to a little habitat fragment, and this is an exaggeration, you're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small populations. And that is the problem. Small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why? Because all populations fluctuate. Good times they go up, bad times they go down. This is a, a large population, the top line here, even in its down cycle, there's enough individuals that it can increase rapidly when times get better. But if you're a tiny population in those normal fluctuations, you often hit zero and you, you blink out of your little habitat patch and then you're gone. And unless you recolonize, you're gone permanently. That's called local extinction. And it's, it's getting harder and harder for things to recolonize. Picture a, a box turtle crossing any road, let alone a major highway. It doesn't happen anymore. And studies all over the planet are telling us the same thing. The natural areas that we have left are not large enough to support the amount of nature that we need to support our huge populations. I've discovered that, that people have a limited ability to absorb bad news. I call it your bad news cup. And when your bad news cup fills up, you turn off. You're not going to listen anymore. And you may have come here today with your bad news cup filled up. I don't know. Uh, but I'm going to try to squeeze a little bit more bad news into your bad news cup, and, and then we'll talk about good news. Um, we, gotta, we have to talk about invasive species. Let's just talk about invasive plants. Let's define what an invasive species is, first of all. A lot of people, I've heard people talk about Virginia creeper, a good native plant, and saying, it's invasive. What you really mean is it's aggressive. It grows quickly. Invasive, the definition is got to be a non-native plant that is displacing native plant communities. You're replacing a native plant community with something from someplace else. That's the definition of invasive. We now have 33, actually more than 3,300 species of plants from someplace else doing that to native plant communities all over the country. And when they do that, this is what, what it looks like. Uh, this is White Clay Creek State Park. I drive by it on the way to work when I, when I go to work um, at the University of Delaware. I did go to work today. I taught this morning, by the way. Uh, and this is what it looks like right now. In, in, in early spring, the plants from Asia leaf out before the plants from, from North America. So what you're looking at here, all the green you see is from, from Asia, primarily from, from China. What are these plants? We know what these plants are. They're all escapees from our garden. It's, it's multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and miscanthus and ailanthus and Norway maple and privet and burning bush and barberry and whatever else you can think of. Again, escapees from our, our garden. So now more than a third of the vegetation in White Clay Creek State Park is not supporting local insects. They have not been here long enough for all those adaptations to, to happen. And you might say, well, how long does it take? Um, that's another talk, but it's, we're talking about tens of thousands of years, not a few years, even though some of these have been here a couple hundred years. Okay, we can, we can actually measure what happens when we allow a non-native plant to displace a native plant community, whether it's from an invasive species or whether we purposely plant these things in our, in our yard. What happens to the food web that used to be in that space? And that's what we've been studying uh, in, in the lab uh, at, at University of Delaware for, I guess it's 12 years now. We have um, several papers published on it. Now, we did not try to make it easy for you, but, um, but we did because we always get the same answer. So read one. You've, you've read them all. But I happen to know you're not going to read any of them. So let's talk about something that you can actually do at home. This is, you know, this is the age of fake news. What if I'm making all this up? <laughs> You've got to test it yourself and see whether or not there's, there's any, any uh, truth to this. Remember, bird of truth, that's what chickadee is. This is my 12 by 12 experiment. That's what 12 feet by 12 feet looks like when you stake it out in your yard. You can get your, your school kids, your grandkids, you can do it yourself. Measure the biodiversity that occurs in that, that 12 by 12 section. You get to determine how many things are going to live in that space by determining which plants are there and how many are there. So this is your chance to, to play God. You can keep it as grass, and you can get on your hands and knees on Wednesday and count all the biodiversity in your 12 by 12 section. Won't take you that long. And then, of course, on Saturday, you mow it. You kill it all. Or we could put a tree in there. Let's put a white oak in there. Now, here's a white oak I planted from uh, uh, it's an acorn 
14 years before I took that picture, which just as an aside, uh, it, it proves two things. First of all, oaks grow, which is news to a lot of people. I've heard landscapers tell, tell their clients, do not plant an oak, you won't live long enough to enjoy it. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> it doesn't have to be 300 years old before you can, can enjoy it. It also was free. You do not have to spend thousands of dollars transplanting a, a four inch caliber oak, which is actually it's a bad idea because you've got to root prune that so much that it's got a 50% chance of, of dying. Uh, and then it sits there for at least a decade trying to rebuild the root system. If you start with your acorn, believe me, in a decade, your tree, your acorn tree will be bigger than the one you spent thousands of dollars on. And it'll be alive with a very healthy root system. All right, 12 by 12 uh, uh, experiment. Let's go around that tree, it fills that, sp that space very nicely, and count the caterpillars on the lower branches. We're not climbing on ladders or stools, we're just gonna count the caterpillars, and we're gonna do it on July 25th of 2014, and we're gonna find 410 caterpillars from 19 different species. And I stood back and I took that picture so I could ask you, how many of those caterpillars do you see? <laughs> how much caterpillar damage do you see? That's what we worry about. Yet this is the distance at which we view our trees. But if I knocked on your door and said, you got 410 caterpillars on your oak tree, ah, get the spray can, call the man, save the tree. You don't have to save the tree, that's a normal interaction. The oak is doing what it has always done. It is sharing part of its energy with the local caterpillars, which are soon gonna be in the belly of a bird. So I have life in my yard because my oak is willing to do that. I met a, a woman, Tammany Baumgarten, in uh, New Orleans last year who recommended that we all use the, or practice the 10-step program. Take 10 steps back from your trees and all of your insect problems disappear. <laughs> and I, I think that's really good advice. Okay, 12 by 12 experiments, same day, let's go and count the caterpillars on the lower branches of a black cherry. We're going to find 239 caterpillars from 14 different species. Now let's go to my neighbor's house. My neighbor moved in the same month that we did. We have same size properties. He had different plant choices. He really liked calorie pear. Bradford pear, you might know it as. So he planted 32 of them. And I get to pull them out of my yard all the time. Um, it's a plant from, from Asia. Uh, it's a highly invasive species, but it's a, it's a favorite ornamental. So the first thing we have to do is choose which calorie pear we're gonna measure. Let's choose this one. Actually, the first thing we do is make sure he's not home. <laughs> so we walk around 12 by 12. Now, I bet you, you, you think I'm gonna say there were no caterpillars on that tree, but there were, there was one. One inchworm, one caterpillar, one species on the calorie pair. Then I went to his burning bush, 12 by 12 section, another highly invasive ornamental that I'm pulling out of my yard all the time. I found four caterpillars from one species, four little leaf skeletonizers. Well, you know, in science, um, science is not opinion, by the way. Science is, is the result of experimentation. But we just did an experiment, we got a pattern. Is that real or is that due to, to chance? Because you can get chance results, so you have to repeat it. You have to repeat it over and over again to see whether the pattern you got is, is real. So let's do it again the next day, July 26. Same species, but we'll pick different individuals of those species. And we get the same pattern. We get different numbers, but the same pattern. 233 in the white oak, 53 in the black cherry, two in the burning bush, one on the calorie pear. And that is the pattern you will get no matter how many times you do that. These plants from Asia have not been here long enough to support the insect populations that are running the food webs that run our, our ecosystems. They're not evil plants, but we've taken them out of the places where they evolved. Over in Europe, or, or Asia, I'm sure they support lots of things, but over here they, they don't. Rick Dark and I gave a talk in um, Williamsburg, not this spring, but, uh, but uh, the past spring, and after the talk, we, we drove up the, across the Bay Bridge, up the eastern shore of Maryland on the way home, and after you, you go over the Bay Bridge, you get to the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill, it's the first establishment you come across and there we go, all the calorie pears in, in full bloom. And that's why, why people plant them. It's one of the reasons. Being the cheapest tree in the market has something to do with it too. Uh, not bad fall color. If you get the ice storm, it's not good. They all fall down. They don't live very long, maybe 30 years old. So these guys are mature. They're, they're probably not there if I were to go back today. Okay, so we kept driving right past the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill and we got to this property. 
which is owned by a land conservancy, by the way. I don't know how many acres it is, but look, it is thoroughly invaded with the offspring from these trees. So this is the, the horticultural ethical dilemma of our, our times. Most people would argue that the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill has the right to put any plant it wants on its property. Property rights, you can do whatever you want. But do they have the right to biologically pollute, to ecologically castrate all of the land around them? I can drive from New York City to Richmond, Virginia right now and it's white all the way down. And nobody planted those plants, they're all escapees from places like the Sunset Beach and in, and in Grill. You know, we get it that you're not allowed to release a, a vial of, of um, smallpox spores on your property because they're not gonna stay in your property. These guys are tumors and they don't stay where we plant them. And that's the way we need to start thinking about our invasive plants. That's why it is worth it to start, start removing them because this could be really good scrub habitat, making lots of caterpillars, supporting lots of bird reproduction, but it's not. It's a dead zone at this point. Um, Roy Dennis, a, a land manager in England, recently said that uh, land ownership is more than a privilege, it is a responsibility. And I completely agree with that. Um, you know, we've taken the, the biosphere surrounding the earth, that thin, thin little film of life, where all of the life, complex life forms that we know of in the entire universe occurs, and we've chopped it up into little pieces and said, Tom owns this, Dick owns this, Harry owns that. Okay, but along with that ownership comes the responsibility of supporting the only life in the universe. It's an awesome responsibility. We have to start thinking that way. Well, how do we maintain that life? How do we encourage the, the life around us to return to the landscapes that we've, we've stripped it from? Um, we have made lists in, in my, my lab. This is the first list we made. It's a ranking of the woody plant genera in the mid-Atlantic states. Uh, and the, the little numbers, or the numbers in parentheses after each plant genus are the number of species of caterpillars recorded as using those plants as, as host plants, recorded in the literature. So they're ranked from the ones that record the most, or, or uh, support the most to the ones that support the least. So memorize that. <laughs> Wanna take a drink? We made this for a particular reason, but we found out um, that it, was, it became popular. Everybody figured out, hey, if I want a lot of life in my yard, I gotta plant um, that end of the, of the chart. So when I go to Wisconsin, they say, where's, where's our list for Wisconsin? This is the mid-Atlantic states, and actually Ohio's not, not in there, right in the edge. So where's your list for Ohio? Where's the list for Florida, for California? Uh, it was my, my, uh, my research assistant, Kimberly Shropshire, who made this list. It took her two years, 4,000 references to put all this together. Um, so I used to tell people, well, if you support Kimberly, she will be happy to make you a list. <laughs> well, finally, the Forest Service said, uh, okay, we will support Kimberly for one year, but we want a list for every state in the union, and we want a list for every county in every state. <laughs> Can she do that? really hard for me to get support for poor Kimberly, so I said, of course she can do that. <laughs> uh, she couldn't do it, it took her a year and a half. She got much faster at it. Uh, but it is now launched on the Native Plant Finder. It's called, it's on the National Wildlife Federation called, uh, uh, website called Native Plant Finder. You don't have to worry about the URL, just put in Native Plant Finder and it will pop up. Uh, and the beauty of this is now you just put in your zip code and the ranked list for your county pops up, so you can zero in on the most productive plants, both woody and herbaceous plants for your county. Uh, Audubon has a similar list built off that, that um, list I just showed you there called Plants for Birds, a very pretty site, but it'll give you the best plants for your, your area. So now we have no excuse for saying, I don't know what the best plants are. Yes, you do, you do know. In making this, these lists for every county and every, every state, as soon as we looked at them, we saw a very, very uh, powerful pattern that jumped out. It turns out there's really just a few plant genera that are making most of the food that support our food webs. Uh, and I started calling those plant genera foraging hubs. I have since learned that, that uh, you people don't like that term, but I borrowed it from people who study uh, birds in the tropics that forage for fruit on particular trees. Those researchers call those trees foraging hubs because everything's going into forage on it. Excuse me. So I started calling uh, our, our trees foraging hubs. They're going in to get insects. Um, but this, this encouraged me. I was sitting on a, a delta plane 
once. In Philadelphia, if you sit on a Delta plane in Philadelphia, you don't go anywhere, you sit on the tarmac. <laughs> so I was, I was reading the Delta magazine and those are the Delta hubs. I said, well, that's, that's what I'm talking about here. This is perfect pictorial representation. Let's make them foraging hubs. Here we go, we have a willow, a cherry, a pine, an oak. All of the lines going into this oak here could be a bird, it could be a species of bird. It's something going into that tree to get a good meal because that tree's making a lot of food. These other black dots in this landscape are other plants, and there are lines going into those other plants, but not very many, because they're not making very much food. So imagine what would happen if you took these, these foraging hubs, or we can, we can call them keystone genera. Take those keystone genera out of the landscape. You would still have dozens of other plants, but you'd have a failed food web, because the ones making most of the food are gone. And we have, we have measured it now, it's about 5% of the local plant genera are making between 73 and 75 percent of the of the food so we could we can twist that on its head and say you could plant 95 percent of the local plant genera in your yard and still have a failed food web if you don't include these these keystone genera so this is it's a it's a nuance but it's an important one it's not just native versus non-native anymore it's powerful natives versus other plants. We do want a diversity of other native plants, particularly for supporting our, our um, pollinators, our bees, uh, but you're going to have a failed food web if you don't include those, those powerhouse genera. Let's, let's just talk about a few. Oaks, number one again, 557 species of caterpillars in the mid-Atlantic states, or if you don't like caterpillars, call them bird food. 557 species of bird food. Let's compare that to, to ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from, from Asia. Um, you know ginkgos, they're planted in our, our cities all the time. Our, uh, our list said they have five species of caterpillars on them, uh, but we've tracked them down. Those are all mistaken host records. Those are, those are mistakes that people published in the literature. One of those guys is the uh, Cecropia moth. And I know what happened. You know, Cecropia moths and many other, uh, other butterflies and moths will eat the plant, you know, eat the leaves from the host plant that they are specialized on. Um, and when they're finished with their development, they crawl off the plant and they'll walk for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, uh, and then stop wherever they are and, and spin their cocoon, build their, their chrysalis. And they're doing that to remove themselves from the plant because the natural enemies, particularly their parasitoids, go to the plant to try to find them. And if they're someplace else, um, they're not there. There's a, 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 a Cecropia cocoon on my back porch right now. It wasn't eating my back porch. It crawled there from a, a nearby cherry tree. So what I think happened is that a, a Cecropia moth crawled up a, a ginkgo tree and spun its cocoon there. And somebody found the cocoon and logically assumed, well, it was eating the ginkgo, but it, but it wasn't. And that's true for the other species as well. But even if those are good host plant records, oh, by the way, if anybody ever sees anything actually eating a ginkgo, take a picture of it and send it to me. I've been saying that for years, I have no pictures. But maybe you'll be the first. But if you are the first, that'll be one versus 557. Which would you plant if you're trying to support local wildlife? Number two on, on most of the list around the country are native prunus. Those things like black cherry and pin cherry and American plum, Chickasaw plum, 456 species of caterpillars, 456 species of bird food compared to Zelkova. Using Zelkova as a street tree around here? We sure are. It's another tree from, from uh, Asia. I guess we use it because it looks like the elms we lost to Dutch elm disease. Zero caterpillars on, on Zelkova. So if, you're, if your goal is to have a plant that will interact with nothing and always be, be perfect like this, and of course that's an ornamental goal, then Zelkova is certainly for you. But why not plant a silk Zelkova or a plastic one? And you won't have to water it, it'll be just as interactive as if you had a, a living one. Pieris japonica used to be the most common foundation plant we had in North America. This illustrates an important point. We have native Pieris, we have native Pieris, but it's a small genus, it doesn't support very many caterpillars, only two. I don't think there's anything on, on Pieris japonica. It could be a native viburnum that supports 103 species of caterpillars. So there are consequences to the choices of plants we make uh, that we put in our yards. Think of the plants in your yards as if they were bird feeders. There you go, they are bird feeders. Now you get to decide how well you're gonna feed the birds by the plants that you choose for your yard. You can feed them a lot, or you can feed them just a little bit, that's what the landscapes around me look like. They're giant lawns with almost no plants in them at all. 
you can put plants in your yard that make bird food. You can put food in your bird feeders, or you can keep them empty. There's a ginkgo right there. It's a big tree, but it's not making any, any caterpillars. And when we landscape like this without thinking about those foraging hubs or those keystone genera, we are not fooling the birds. Here's a little bit of data from my, my PhD student, Desiree Narango, who's, who's actually graduating two weeks next week. She studied chickadees in the, the suburbs of Washington, D.C., three years of following breeding chickadees around in particular landscapes so she could see what their breeding success was in relation to the percentage of non-native plants in those landscapes. So here's one pair of chickadees. The star is where the nest is. The red line represents the foraging territory of those chickadees. It's about 50 meters from the nest on average. And the blue areas represent the trees in which they did 95% of their foraging when they were rearing their young. So let's look at what those trees are. Uh, well, they're all the native trees in the landscape. Basswood, sweet gum, American elm, black cherry, two species of, of oaks. Let's also look at the trees they're not foraging on. Japanese maple, silk tree, there's our friend the ginkgo, black poplar, crepe myrtle, saucer magnolia. And it's really easy to, to picture a landscape in which those are the dominant trees. How do, the, how do the chickadees know which trees to go in? Well, they don't know. They try it out. They go into a black poplar or a ginkgo and they try to get something to eat. There's nothing there, so they don't go back. How often would you go back to, to ShopRite if the shells were always bare? You'd go once and then you wouldn't go back, and that's exactly what the chickadees do. And when we landscape like this, this, this is the result. This is a failed nest, and after Desiree took the three dead chicks out of the nest, she noticed a bunch of sunflower seeds in the bottom of the nest. Remember, parents, the chickadees don't eat sunflower seeds. Well, what she thinks happened is the parents simply ran out of, of uh, caterpillars and somebody had a feeder up, so they, they brought seeds to the nest, tried to get the babies to eat them, but they couldn't eat them. Um, so the babies, babies starved to death. There are, again, consequences. When you compare, and this is a summary of her work, uh, yards that were primarily native, none of her yards were 100% native, with lands that were yards that were dominated by, by uh, introduced plants. This is what you got. In the yards that were dominated by introduced plants, they produced 75% fewer <laughs> caterpillars. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So even though she, uh, Desiree put a nest box up in those yards, uh, chickadees are tree hole nesters and their nest box, or tree holes are always in short supply. The parents came and they looked around and they said, there's simply not enough to eat here, so they wouldn't even try. But if they did try, uh, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive. They produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and they, it took them 1.5 days longer to produce those fledglings. And what you're not seeing here are that those fledglings less, left the nest underweight. And that means their future um, survivorship was, was lower as well. And when you put all that together, you can create population growth models. And she modeled her population growth rates as a function of the percentage of non-native plants in the landscapes. And by the way, she was following 93 pairs of breeding chickadees. So this is a lot of data. The dotted line here uh, represents replacement rate. That is the number of chicks you have to make or the rate at which your population has to grow in order to replace the adults that are lost each, each, uh, each year. So anything below that dotted line represents an ecological sink. It represents a, an unsustainable population because each year it has smaller and smaller. It's not making enough chickadees. So these are error bars, and uh, it turns out that when you have, it's about 25% or fewer non-native plants. Some of the yards actually popped above replacement. They were making uh, enough chickadees to replace the population. But all of the others, as soon as you got more than 95 or 25% non-native plants, are well below replacement. Now, in her study, the average uh, yard had 50% non-native, so it was way down here. We've looked at the number of non-natives close to where, where I live. It's 79%, way over here. Again, way below what it needs to be to keep these populations sustainable. So if you're wondering why we have 432 birds that are, that are uh, steeply declining, there's a lot of reasons for that, but starving them has gotta be, gotta be one of them. She also looked at the migrants that are stopping in her yards uh, on their spring migration. Uh, now migrants, uh, I don't know if you thought about this, but they fly all night 
and at the end of the night they have to come down and rest, but they have to refuel. They've got to gas up so they can continue their, their migration. They're not flying around our cities. Remember, this is Washington, D.C. They're flying right through them, and they come down. We've got 51 species of migrants that, that uh, she has recorded in her, her study plots. And if they come down in the land of ginkgo, there's nothing to eat. And that's the end of the migration. They're out of gas. Have you ever seen a little bird in the middle of a parking lot just sitting there shivering? That's a migrant that has run out of fuel. So you might say, I do not have a property big enough to support a breeding bird, and that might be true. Um, but if you have a property big enough to support one tree, and you make it a good tree, then you can support migrating birds, and they certainly need your, your support. So you don't have to save biodiversity for a living, but please consider saving it where you live. Because where you live is now a very important component of the conservation uh, needs that we have. We have moved plants and animals all over the world, creating what ecologists call novel ecosystems. And what that means is a novel ecosystem is defined as one in which the organisms are just meeting each other for the first time in evolutionary history. And what that means is they have not had the time to develop the specialized relationships that are so common in nature. Remember, monarch butterfly specialized relationship. We've created novel ecosystems by replacing milkweeds with soybeans. And if you're waiting for monarchs to adapt to soybeans, you can keep waiting because they're going to disappear long before that happens. So we're losing species from these novel ecosystems. And if these novel ecosystems are bleeding species, we might want to ask, how many species do we need? How many species do we humans need? Let's be selfish about it. We can do that, I know. I'm going to argue that we need all of them. We need all of them. Because it is the plants and animals in our ecosystems that are running those ecosystems, that are producing what we call ecosystem services, the life support systems that are keeping humans alive on, on planet Earth. And research has shown, we don't have time to go into it, but it's shown very clearly that as you increase the number of species in an ecosystem, that ecosystem becomes more productive. And as you take species away, it becomes less productive. We need as much productivity as we can get today because this is what we've done to planet Earth. There was a, a big study came out in 2005, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. It was 170 scientists from around the planet. It took five years and studied planet Earth's ability to support us to produce the ecosystem services that we need. And their unhappy conclusion as of 2005 is that we had already degraded the planet's ability to support us by 60%. That's the ocean, by the way. That's not a uh, recycling plant. That's the same as taking planet Earth and shrinking it by 60%. At the same time, we keep increasing human numbers and we keep growing our economies. We all know we have to grow our economy indefinitely, and we can. We can grow our economies, we can grow our populations at the same rate that the Earth is growing. That's not a very popular opinion, particularly among economists. Um, but if you don't believe me, we could all go, let's go to Cape Town, South Africa, and meet there this summer. Um, it used to be July something when you had day zero. Now it's moved up to May. We're going to have day zero when they run out of water. Not because of a war or anything, because there are too many people there for the amount of water that they're, they're using. The, my point here is very simple. The Earth has limits. It has limits, and we've got to recognize them. We have to start living like that. We've taken much of, of particularly North America and turned it into Gone with the Wind because we, we love aesthetic landscapes. You know, we think plants are just decorations and here we have a, a decorative landscape. I don't know how many acres that is and I don't know how many species used to live there, but I do know it was thousands um, and they literally are now gone with the wind. So what we need to do is expand the Earth's ability to support us again. We need to increase its carrying capacity by putting the plants back. That's not too hard. We can do that. We can do that. Where are we going to put those plants? Well, 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 95% of Texas is privately owned. 94% of Maine is privately owned. 83% of the entire lower 48 is privately owned. We're going to put those plants back on private property. Don't think public lands are going to be enough to save the biodiversity we need. There's not nearly enough space. We need to put the plants back right there. And when we do that, we need to raise the bar about what we're asking our landscapes to do. Again, in the past, we've asked them to be pretty. We're good at that. We're going to keep doing that. But they also have to support life. 
If we don't support those, if we don't build those food webs at home, we're going to lose the biodiversity that we all depend on. They have to sequester carbon. You know, we have way too much carbon in the air. A third of it, by the way, has come from us removing the forests on planet Earth and all the other plants for the last, I don't know, seven, 8,000 years. That carbon's up in the atmosphere right now. It's about a third. We can pull that out by putting the plants back. I had a student uh, a couple of years ago said, we need to invent a machine that pulls carbon out of the air and fixes it. I said, well, we have that machine. It's called a tree. Not only does the tree fix it, not only does your, do your prairie grasses fix it and all the other plants, they then pump carbon into the soil for as long as they're in that soil. That's what creates that dark horizon in your soil. It's built with carbon. But when we plow the soil up, when we get our bulldozers out, 70% goes up into the atmosphere. So we need to put the plants back that are going to pump the carbon into the soil. Our soil scientists are now telling us that the Earth's soils are capable of sequestering seven times the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere. If you're looking for a solution, that's it. Put the carbon back in the soil. We also have to put the plants in our yards that manage the watersheds in which we live. Everybody lives in a watershed and nobody has the ethical right to destroy that. Nobody goes out purposely to destroy it, but that's what we do when we, when we have mindless landscaping. And of course, we need to support our pollinators. Supporting pollinators is politically correct now, or it was last year. <laughs> Why do we need to support pollinators? I know what you're going to tell me. Because they pollinate our crops. And they do, about a third of our crops. But you know what? That is not the most important reason. This is, they, they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, Forget our crops, we would lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. It's not an option. It is simply not an option. We are losing our pollinators. So we have to start supporting them at home. We're not talking about good land stewardship here. We're talking about essential land stewardship. It's absolutely essential for our future. There's a family that lives in this house. If they're not producing all the ecosystem services they need, on a daily basis, they're gonna to have to borrow them from someplace else. Now in the past, they borrowed them from nature, but the nature that used to be here isn't there anymore, and that's true almost everywhere. They're not gonna borrow them from their neighbor because he's not making any ecosystem services either. They're probably not gonna borrow them from their, their township's open space. If it looks like my township's open space, which is a giant lawn with a, a paved path that goes around it and people walk in circles around it. We think if there's not a building on, on a place, that's good land stewardship. That is not good land stewardship. That is not good land stewardship. That's, this is a, another neighbor down the street. These are all calorie pears, and they're all gone. They fell down last year. So now there are no trees here, no food webs, very little carbon sequestration. You know, if you want to sequester carbon, lawn is the worst option you can have, even though the lawn industry says your, your lawn is sequestering carbon. It is about 120 pounds per acre per year but a meadow sequesters about 3,000 pounds per acre per year, and a forest sequesters about 3,500 pounds of carbon per acre per year. This landscape is actively destroying my watershed, and I don't appreciate it. All the nasties he puts on this beautiful lawn are going washing away and poisoning everything, helping to create dead zones at the mouth of every, every river. And of course, there are no, no pollinators here. So this, this is, not taking care of that biosphere we talked about very, very well. We measured the amount of land that we have in um, southeast, in Delaware, southeast Pennsylvania, and northeast Maryland. 92% of the land that could be landscaped is lawn. 92% lawn, looks just like that. Only 10% of the tree biomass that could be there is there. And there's usually these short-lived ornamental trees from, from Asia like our, our calorie pear here, um, that are going to fall over after 30 years and release all the carbon they just sequestered. We've got to get the big guys back that are going to hold that carbon for hundreds of years and pump it into the soil. There's my neighbor's house with all his calorie pears. He's got 10 acres, and every plant he's put on that property, every single plant is an out-of-towner, is a non-native. And he's done that because that's what everybody does. He goes to the nursery, and he looks for something that's pretty. Remember, plants are just decorations, or at least that it's what we have thought. So something is pretty, maybe it could be a screen or an anchor or a focal point, but it's all been about aesthetics. No attention to the ecological role that these plants have to start playing. 
But we could do that. We could find pretty plants that do support food webs, that protect our watershed, that sequester carbon, that, that help our pollinators, that provide all the life support systems we need to start doing at home. How do we do that? What's a biodiversity friendly neighborhood look like? Well, this is the most important thing we need to do. We need to, we need to put the plants back in between the isolated habitat fragments that are out there. Who's in between those fragments? We are, we are. We need to build biological corridors that connect those fragments right where we live. And if we connect them, those fragments are not isolated anymore. And if they're not isolated anymore, the populations within them won't be tiny anymore. So when they fluctuate, and they will, they won't disappear anymore. This is the single most important thing we can do to stop the steady drain of species from our neighborhoods. Where are we going to put all those plants? I suggest we put them in the area that's now in lawn. We have 45.6 million acres of lawn. We're still adding 500 square miles of lawn a year. That's an area the size of New England that is now, now lawn. And we're doing that because turf grass is a status symbol. And it's been a status symbol for a couple hundred years. Because only the rich used to be able to have good lawns. You know, before we invented the lawnmower, you either had enough slaves or you had enough sheep, and you could afford to waste property that wasn't in agriculture because you were so rich. So it was a great advertisement of your social status, and we all wanted it. Well, around the turn of the century, we invented the lawnmower, and then all of us poor slobs could have lawn. But we keep raising the bar. In the 50s, you had to have a perfect lawn or you were a communist. <laughs> and of course, now, you listen to the, to the commercials, and if there's a dandelion in your lawn, you're not a good person, and your neighbor's going to hate you. And we buy into that. We buy into that. But we can change our status symbols. I learned that when I went to Montana a couple of years ago. Um, I looked around, they didn't have big lawns. And I asked, I asked my host, where, where are their big lawns? And he said, well, we only get nine inches of rain a year. Uh, he said, but, but lawn is not our status symbol. I said, it's not? What is? And he thought about it and he said, big belt buckles. <laughs> and I'm very excited about that. <laughs> because if we double the size of our belt buckles, and cut the size of our lawn in half, I think we've got it. And of course, of course we wanna build these carters out of those, those Keystone Jenner we were talking about. Or at least they've gotta be in there. This is what we've done in the past. We build our house, put in our, our, our foundation plant, a few trees here and there, then we're exhausted, no more landscaping. So everything by default becomes lawn. Let's turn that on its head. Let's build our house and now figure out where we do want lawn. I am not suggesting we get rid of turf grass because it is the perfect plant to walk on. So you put the lawn where you want to walk. I look at where my neighbors walk on their 10 acres and what you couldn't see it from that picture, but most of it is manicured lawn. Nowhere, they're never outside. But what if you want to get married in, in the front yard? You need some lawn there. If you want to walk to the backyard, you need a path, throw the Frisbee, have a barbecue. Wherever you want to interact with your interesting landscape now, that's where the lawn goes. And then everything else by default becomes heavily planted. This is the landscape design challenge of our times. How do we get all these plants in our landscapes without it looking wild and messy? It's a different aesthetic. It's gonna take a little bit of adjustment, but we can do it. And if we convince our neighbors to do it too, now we've got the connectivity with the woodlot over here and the woodlot over here, or if you're in Illinois or Iowa, the prairie over here and the prairie over here, you gotta do it in biome appropriate ways. Not only will you stop the steady drain of species from your neighbor, you'll reverse it, they will come. And I can tell you that because of what we've witnessed happening at, at our house at home. We put the plants back and it's, it's just crawling with life. We still have lawn, so we can still play with our lawnmowers. It will be okay. And if we do this in half the area that's in, in lawn right now, let's make the math simple. Say we got 40 million acres, we cut that in half, we can build a new national park that'll be 20 million acres in size. Um, we're gonna do it at home, so we'll call it Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You had up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So let's do that. This is the entrance to the Toledo Zoo. You ever been to the Toledo Zoo? That's the entrance, lovely entrance with the grass and dandelions. Could be that. And when the zoo people did that, the board of directors went nuts. They said, nobody's gonna to come to the zoo anymore. Culture's very hard to change. It really is, it really is. Let's take these square things here. 
and turn it into a landscape like this is on Fisher's Island. It's a, it's a little island off the coast of Connecticut. The rich folks live there, Roosevelt's live there. I should have included more of the house, high-end house here. This landscape is doing everything that I talked about with one exception, it's not supporting the pollinator, so let's put a pollinator garden in as well. Now we got it covered, we're covered our basis. This is the, the current agricultural <coughs> ethic. Um, this grower is high status now because he's replaced all of his weeds uh, with lawn. And it shows he, he cares, it shows he's a good land steward. It could be this. Now that first picture was from Iowa, this is also from Iowa. People are starting to do this, they're starting to, to catch on. This is, a, this is a malt sculpture <laughs> down the street from me, which proves you cannot use native plants in a formal design. <laughs> Except nobody told the folks in, in um, I guess this is Indianapolis, an all native planting in a formal garden. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal gardens in Europe all the time. And it's okay because they're non-native over there. So it works. <laughs> this is a corporate landscape that invites the employees to come out at noon to get sunburn. Could be a lovely setting like this. And there's really fascinating research that, that, um, that says if you spend just 15 minutes in a landscape like this, wonderful things happen. Measurable medical benefits. Your blood pressure drops, your stress hormone, your cortisol drops, your cancer is cured, you don't get divorced anymore. <laughs> the reason I say that is, um, you get the same benefits you get from intense meditation, which has been shown to boost the immune system. It also restores your attention span. Our attention span is eroded from the time we wake up in the morning uh, until we finally go home and, and yell at our spouses. But 15 minutes in a, in a landscape like this and you become a new person. You can pay attention, you can be a good conversationalist, it's a wonderful thing. Um, but you can't, you can't go to Yellowstone in the summer for two weeks and expect that if those effects to last the rest of the year. You have to do this every single day. So the only way you can get those benefits is to either live in a landscape like that or work in a landscape like that. But it's gotta be a daily adventure. So I'm gonna put another ball up here, call it mental health. We can call it physical health. You put a plant outside of a hospital room, the patient gets better faster. You put a tree outside of a classroom, test scores go up. And everybody's scratching their heads, what's going on? Apparently it's related to stress. When you reduce stress with nature, you do everything better. Very good news, very good news. Does that mean your yard has to be 100% native? Um, no, there really is room for, for compromise here. And I'm gonna use the crepe myrtle as an example. Um, I know you use some, some crepe myrtles and as you go further south, they use a lot of crepe myrtles and by the time you get to South Carolina, it's now the only plant in the state. <laughs> Why? Because it's, it's the perfect decoration. You can get it in any color. It's not too tall. It has exfoliating bark. It, of course, is a, is a tree from Asia. What do, what do its leaves contribute to food webs? Nothing, right. Uh, so what's, you know, what's, what's pretty but not biologically active? Well, I always think of a statue, but how many statues? <laughs> you know, one or two. One or two is okay, but how do you know when you've succeeded? There are countless ways to measure whether you've succeeded or not, but this, this has got to be one of them. When you have holes in your leaves. This is holistic gardening. <laughs> this is a shingle oak leaf in my yard that has passed on part of its energy to a caterpillar, which again is now in the belly of a bird. I have life in my yard because this oak is willing to do that. Look, it's not dead. It's not dead. This is a normal interaction. And again, you won't notice this in a typical tree because you're not close enough to see it. So if you look at the leaves in your yard and they're perfect, you have failed. The energy is captured by the plant and it hasn't passed it on to anything else. When you have fireflies in your yard, I get asked all the time, how come I don't have fireflies or lightning bugs or whatever you want to call them the way I had when I was young? Well, they're not flies and they're not bugs, they're beetles. That's what the adult looks like. That's what the larva looks like. Looks like a little tank and, it, and it, uh, it's a predator in leaf litter. So if you rake up all your leaves and throw it out every year, you've thrown out where it lives, you've thrown the food out that it lives in. If you have chem lawn, you have poisoned it. If you have security lights on all night long, you've messed up the adult communication. So if you get fireflies back in your neighborhood somewhere, you're doing several things right. But this is the big one. If you have breeding birds in your yard, not five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. They gotta be in your yard. That shows you've got enough food in your yard to support that interaction. 
which is a, it's a powerful measure of success. So we can save nature, but only if we learn to live with it. And I'm gonna leave you with one example of how easy this can actually be. This is the Atala butterfly that was accidentally saved from extinction in South Florida by residential landscaping. It's a beautiful butterfly, little Lycaenid that's beautiful as an adult, beautiful as a larva, beautiful as a chrysalis. It's an extreme host plant specialist. Eats one species of plant, the kunti, which is a native cycad in South Florida. Well, Kunti has an interesting history. It had a lot of starch in its roots. The Seminole Native Americans used to know that. Well, used to use it as a source of starch. Uh, and when the settlers came to Florida, they, they taught them. They said, there's a lot of starch in Kunti roots. So the settlers used it as well. And around 1900, somebody said, let's make a starch industry out of Kunti roots. In 1908, something like that, they did a census in Miami. 80% of the people rec uh, um, said that their occupation was starch gatherer. And they did, they gathered all the starch. Uh, they, they extirpated kunti from the wild. It is still extirpated from the wild. There were a few plants in gardens, but it was eliminated. And of course, you've taken away the only host plant the butterfly eats, you're gonna lose the butterfly. Well, around 1973, we got the Endangered Species Act. There was a desperate attempt to find some atalas so they could get it listed as an endangered species so they could get some federal funding to try to save it, but they couldn't find any. Looked all over, couldn't find any, so they got it officially listed as extinct. Uh, well, about that time, the horticultural trade recognized Kunti as a, a uh, valuable landscape plant. It's a low-growing evergreen shrub, does well in the sandy soils of South Florida, so they started to promote it. And now we have big plantings of Kunti, like this in parks and people's yards. It's a very common plant down there. And look who, look who showed up again. I used to say nobody knows where it came from, but uh, now somebody's claiming there was a remnant population on one of the keys, and it's out colonizing the Kunti, and it's doing it fast. It's up as far, far north as Vero Beach right now uh, because people are planning, planning Kunti. So I, I love the story because it truly was a mistake. They never got that, that butterfly listed as an endangered species, so they never got one dime of conservation money, which is good because we don't have very many dimes of conservation money. All they did was change the palette of plants that are used in residential landscaping by one. They added Kunti, and the butterfly saved itself, which shows this is a really powerful form of conservation. If we can save this butterfly by accident, by changing the way we landscape, think what we could do if we made conservation a conscious goal of landscaping. And I think it's gonna work because uh, nature has, has impressed me. It's been a lot more resilient and malleable and forgiving than I ever thought she would be. I can guarantee that she's not endlessly forgiving though. There's a point at which she won't bounce back. But I do think she's gonna give us one more chance. Remember what the Donald says, make America native again. Thank you very much. There you are. Thank you, thank you. We're gonna do some questions. Um, and I know it's a long talk. If you have to go, I understand, but, but um, will you actually have another microphone if somebody wants it, or I'll repeat the, the question. Yes. <laughs> Are we making progress with, with um, homeowners associations, local government, civic association? Yes, we are, actually. Um, some people, uh, I guess it was a uh, uh, place in Maryland actually uh, passed an ordinance, a native plant ordinance, sent it to me, and I get requests for that all the time. I just send it out to everybody who wants to change ordinances in their, their township. Um, remember, HOAs that are telling you you have to have certain plants and you have to mow your lawn one half inch and you have to make sure you have a dead landscape. Those rules were made by people mostly in the 70s, and they were made to protect property values because, because they didn't want rusting cars in the front yard. And remember, if you didn't manicure your lawn, you were a bad person. But we're learning, we've learned, and we also learned we can change those rules. Become a member of your, your, your civic association, your HOA, and, and educate them. And people are listening, it's happening all over the place. I've been looking at this for, for um, I don't know, at least 10 years, and I'm seeing, I'm seeing change. So. Um, there's a lot of bad news here, but it is happening in a positive direction, so, so be encouraged. Look, 
Look at the people that came out in the rain. You know? <laughs> this, is, this is what's happening here. Yeah. Yes? Just a question. Besides looking in native plants, can you give some tips as to how to find caterpillars? Huh, how to find caterpillars? Sure. Um, you have to develop a search image. That's what birds do, they develop a search image. Caterpillars don't want you to find them. They don't want the birds to find them, so a lot of them are, are cryptic. They're blending in very well with their leaves. A lot of them feed on the edge of the leaf and they look like uh, decayed leaf material. They look a lot like decayed leaf material. They're sitting on the midrib and they blend right in with that. They crawl off the leaf during the day and only feed at night, so they're on the bark during the day. They're almost always underneath the leaf unless they taste bad and then they advertise their bad taste on, on top of the leaf. So you look in all those places. You have to look at the right times of year too. Don't look in the spring. All those birds that are feeding their young have beaten you to it, believe me. Their, their caterpillars are gone, they find every last one of them. So I, the best time to find caterpillars would be uh, later July, uh, early August. And they vary, some years are really good, some years are bad. Um, last couple of years have not been very good, but I think three years ago, it was the year of the caterpillar. They were everywhere. So they do fluctuate, uh, and you can learn. You know, uh, uh, again, Dave Wagner's book, Caterpillars of Eastern North America, uh, will give you pictures of what these things look like. So when you find them, you can put a name on them. You can go to Mothapalooza. <laughs> Mothapalooza in southern Ohio every year. Um, I know, not this year, yeah, next year and learn all about, about the caterpillar, so. Yes? Light pollution, yeah, we're learning about light pollution. Of course, light pollution is no good for stargazing, but uh, there was a study that came out recently, in, again, in Europe, where they, they had night vision goggles on, and they looked at the insects, particularly the moths that were going to flowers at night, and they counted them all for a while. Then they erected typical street lights in the very same place a drop of 62% of the moth populations because of that light pollution. And look around you, where do we not have light pollution? Not only that, but when you have your security light on, the moths, many of these moths don't have mouth parts. So they emerge with all the energy they're ever gonna have. That's particularly true with the giant silk moths. And they fly around and when that energy is used up, they're done. Um, so they're flying around your light, the bats come, pick them off. Lights are, are, are moth death traps. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean you can't have a security light. Put a motion sensor on it so that it turns on when the bad man comes. That's why you want the security light there, right? You know, when you have it on all the time, it throws dark shadows and he just stays in the dark shadows. It doesn't discourage anybody, so. <laughs> security lights. Anything else? Yes. I couldn't have said it better, right. <laughs> you know, you have to have a little sympathy for, for green, particularly greenhouse growers, because it is very difficult to grow plants in mass in a greenhouse without having serious pest problems. Of course, it is possible during the growing season to grow those plants outside and those pest problems disappear. The problem with neonics is that they're systemic. So the plant takes them up and holds them in their tissues, depending on which species it is. If it's a woody plant, they can hold it in there for years. Uh, an herbaceous plant will hold it for months and they can grow out of it, but um, there have been some very nasty stories, people planting a lot of milkweeds for, for monarchs and then the monarchs come and they all die and they find out they were treated with, with neonics. So um, the nursery industry will change if you apply the pressure uh, to get them to change. And more and more nurseries are finding ways to do it without neonicotinoids, so it is possible. So apply that pressure and, and they, will, they will bend to it, yes. Davis? Davis Nursery? Dayton. Dayton Nursery. Okay. Good. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, one more in the back, one more in the back, then we'll let you go. <laughs> what a 
about the deer? Yeah, I'm glad you asked about the deer. I talked about invasive species. Um, one of the things, there's a, a very serious interaction between deer, overabundance of deer, and invasive species. Deer give the invasives a competitive edge, a serious competitive edge, because they eat the natives first. So the little oak pops its, its head up, and the deer get that, and they leave the burning bush, and they leave the barberry. Um, and it's, we used to think, well, the natives are not as competitive as these, these invasives. Um, but the exclosure experiments where the deer are excluded are showing that that's, that's largely not true. There was one that came out, experiment came out, I think two years ago, where they had 10 years of a study pitting garlic mustard with trillium. And in 10 years with no deer, the trillium won. Uh, so we have to give our, our, our natives a lot more credit than we have been giving them, but we have too many deer. We have too many deer, which gives us too much Lyme disease. It's destroying our forests because they're eating the undergrowth, and that's why we've got nothing but, but um, non-natives as, as understory. Uh, and it's not the deer, deer's fault. We've taken away the deer predators. Right now, in most places, the only deer predator is our car, and that's not a good one. Uh, so if we're going to take away the predators, we have, to, we have to do population control. That's just the way life works. All populations have to be controlled, or they control themselves by running out of resources, and that's not the right way to do it either. So I encourage you to think about deer control. Thank you very much. I have one quick question. Oh, yes. <laughs> one quick one, huh? <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd get away without the cultivar question. The cultivar question is the most common one I, I get. And when you go to the nursery and you try to buy a native plant, most of the time it is a cultivar of that native plant. A cultivar is a genetic variant of the native plant that has been selected almost exclusively for um, aesthetics. Or sometimes it's select, selected for different types of disease resistance. But um, we just finished a study where we compared six different cultivar traits. And we were looking at caterpillars on leaves. We were not looking at pollinators. Um, and this was on woody plants. We looked at whether the leaf was variegated, whether it was uh, changed from green to red or yellow, or red or, or um, purple or blue. Took a tall plant, make it short, introduce disease resistance, enhance fall berries, and enhance fall color. Those were the six traits we looked at. To our surprise, the only trait that actually made a difference to the insects eating those plants consistently was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple because you are, you are changing the leaf chemistry of that, of that leaf. You're putting a lot of anthocyanins in that leaf, which are feeding deterrence. Um, so from one pers perspective, that's, that's good news, particularly from the disease resistance perspective, because there's some plants like, like uh, elms and, and you know, uh, American chestnut and things that we may not have at all if we don't have some disease resistant genes in there. But the focus on cultivars bothers me for, for two reasons. It perpetuates the idea that plants are just decorations. And they're more than decorations. So we should be selling the, the native straight species that are the best at, at producing ecosystem services for people who want them. And nurserymen just don't believe that there's a market for them. So we can, we can say, yes, there is. You supply that as well, and then let the market work out how many cultivars versus how many straight species. Um, the other problem is that most cultivars are propagated clonally. Zero genetic variability, and particularly in this age of, of climate change, when we have such extreme changes all the time, we need as much genetic variability out there as possible. So loading the landscape with zero genetic variability, is, is, that's just bad ecological practice. We know that. So it's another reason to go with, with straight species. Ask your, your nurseryman to get you the straight species, and, because he can. He can do that. He just doesn't think he can sell it. And if he, if he doesn't, then go away. Don't buy the cultivar because he'll say, well, I'll just keep doing that. So thank you.